Q and A's. Um, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, in addition to being Lieutenant Governor, was also selected by the governor to be the uh, chair of the governor's climate task force, which has worked over many months in order to develop a, a more cohesive and coherent strategy for uh, addressing climate change in Wisconsin that also prioritizes climate justice. Uh, we are pleased as punch to have him here joining us. And because we're running late, I'll just turn things over to Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Well, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, and no problem, you know, sometimes we run into technical difficulties, but great job bouncing back and making sure that we are able to still get this show on the road. I am so uh, deeply appreciative of the opportunity to be here. And so again, I'm Mandela Barnes, Lieutenant Governor. I wanna thank you, I wanna thank UW Stevens Point and the Extension for inviting me to be a part of the 2021 Water Week Conference. Um, you know, when the governor and I took office, we knew the state was behind in dealing with issues of the environment, issues of the climate crisis. So in the first year, we vowed to take action. Before we took office, we vowed to take action. And in the first year, some of the first steps we took were to join the U.S. Climate Alliance, which is a bipartisan coalition of states uh, that vowed to still uphold and meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, despite the United States having pulled out of said agreement. Uh, very happy uh, that because of leadership at the state level and the commitment that states had, uh, representing a majority of the population of the United States of America, I believe that uh, we were able to still make some strides. Uh, we weren't just left in the dark. We weren't just left doing nothing. And that's important because I'm proud that our new president, Joe Biden, has made steps to rejoin, or has, excuse me, has taken the steps to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement, which will help put the United States back into a position of leadership that we need to be in. Uh, we set new clean energy goals for our state. We created an Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy. And also, as what was mentioned, the Task Force on Climate Change, which I was so honored to serve as chair. So proud to have led the work, uh, but more proud of the membership of the task force who worked incredibly uh, diligently over the course of a year to push Wisconsin in the right direction. And with, um, with, that, with that task force that represented so many people from across the state, so many industries, so many professions, so many disciplines, backgrounds, regional diversity, everything you could uh, want in a task force and more, uh, we assemble uh, this group and this group put together the most ambitious package to address climate change that our state has seen. And this included environmental organizations, uh, our native communities, business leaders from large and small businesses, utility companies were even a part of this process as well. And we made sure uh, that the task force is bipartisan and included people from groups that don't often sit in the same room, much less agree on policy including uh, you know, people who oftentimes get uh, fingers unjustly pointed in their direction, like our uh, rural and farming communities. Uh, we made sure that everybody was a part of the discussion. And after, like I said, about a year of listening to experts, holding public listening sessions, and talking about the important issues like environmental justice, we released a comprehensive report on our findings last December. And as I said, uh, by comprehensive, I mean ambitious. And we know that this is a huge and complex issue, but our goal for the report was to lay the groundwork for our state to start addressing key issues like flooding and energy efficiency. And we came together around a set of 55 proposed climate solutions that span nine different sectors. This includes transportation, agriculture, energy, climate justice, uh, equity, resilient systems, clean economy, education, forestry, and our food systems. And some of the policies include creating a state office of environmental justice that would address the disproportionate impacts of the climate crisis on lower income communities, on rural communities, communities of color. And we also want to promote resiliency through statewide flood resilience planning, the creation of a chief resilience officer at the state, and, in, uh, and we sought to increase conservation staff at the county level, and to also increase funding for farmer led watershed groups restoring wetlands, forests, and increasing the green space and trees in urban areas. And finally, uh, one of the most important pieces of this puzzle is investing in green job and environmental conservation training programs to help build a clean economy right here in Wisconsin. 
And some of the next steps, uh, the task force report laid the foundation for our state to take swift and necessary action uh, that would benefit the health and state of our economy and also ensure that the air and water are safe and clean. And I'm proud that the governor used the task force report as a guide as he built his 21 to 23 biennial budget, which just came out a few weeks ago. And I'm also proud to say that this is a budget that makes historic investments in conservation and in clean energy. These are the investments that will save us all in the long run, not just in dollars, but in terms of our livelihood. And I'm also proud to say that this budget makes historic investments um, in conservation and clean energy. And these are investments that will not only help protect and preserve the state's natural resources, but also provide economic opportunity to places who, and people who need it the most. And some of the budget items include creation of the Office of Environmental Justice, like I said, the Chief Resilience Officer, which would uh, rest within the new Office of Environmental Justice to help develop and oversee state and local government risk assessment and uh, resilience planning, uh, providing the grants to counties for additional county conservation staff to support climate change resiliency efforts, and also investing over $30 million in programs uh, that help build resilient roads and infrastructure, and restore wetlands to produce, or excuse me, and to prevent catastrophic uh, flooding, and supporting our farmers when their crops are damaged or delayed, as well as uh, an innovative first of its kind program to help Wisconsinites purchase flood insurance. And the reauthorization of the Nelson Nose Stewardship Grant for another 10 years with $70 million in annual bonding authority, along with other critical investments in conservation and forestry will allow Wisconsin to continue its proud legacy and tradition of conserving our natural resources and promoting sustainable economic growth. And this budget builds on the work uh, our administration has done for the past two years related to clean drinking water and also offers comprehensive proposals to ensure that everyone in the state has access to clean water. And the budget also promotes creative uh, flood prevention efforts that help reduce runoff from farms and it also utilizes wetland restoration to reduce the risk of costly flooding. Again, we're incredibly proud of this work. We're incredibly uh, proud of the investments that we're making uh, in conservation and forestry uh, and also combating climate change, which is the most important uh, component. And the investments are greatly needed as Wisconsin continues to feel the costly impacts of climate change. But in order for this to become our reality, we need your support. This won't just happen uh, automatically. It won't just happen because we proposed it. It'll happen through hard work, through organizing, when people come together and demand the change that we all deserve. We have to build the groundswell of support from the public to get these policies passed through the legislature. And I am hoping that we can count on you to help make Wisconsin a clean energy leader, to push us boldly towards a clean energy future, uh, for the sake of us and the sake of generations that are yet to come. And so with that, I just want to say thank you all for having me. Well, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. And I do want to remind listeners, the Q&A panel uh, is where you can type in a question. This is your opportunity to interact uh, with Lieutenant Governor and really ask any question that, that is pressing you about this climate strategy and potentially about um, the budget. I think you know one question I might have is, uh, when, when you really look at what, what's being proposed in the budget, it is dramatic, but it's not as though you're, we're proposing your, the governor's budget proposes, uh, you know, quadrupling everybody's taxes to pay for all these programs, right? This is uh, a fairly modest a, a pr uh, proposal in those lights. I, you know, I'm glad you, you brought that up because not only is it not quadrupling taxes, I mean, think about homeowner's insurance, think about car insurance, you don't look at these as just some exorbitant expenses. You buy it just in case. And this is the way that we have to look at look at this as sort of an insurance policy on our future. Because if we don't spend this money up front, we are going to pay for it in the long run. And the cost will be so much more uh, than it would be if we didn't make these investments. I want to say that a dollar that we spend uh, for resilience uh, will save us $7 in the event of another historic flooding event that we know will come because it is happening all too regularly. You know, these 100 and 500 year storms are happening 
every other year almost, in some instances every year. So uh, this is about making wise choices. Uh, we don't want to be uh, penny wise and pound foolish, as the old saying goes. We want to uh, we want to be smart with our investments, and we want to protect the future. Yeah, that's great. A couple of quick questions here for coming in now from the audience. One of them is if uh, you can just discuss how tribal partners were incorporated both in the climate task force and how tribal communities are, are really a part of this going forward as well. Yeah, we had our tribal communities, our native uh, nations of, of a part of this task force, uh, a couple of tribal members. And we also uh, use the examples uh, of, the, of, the, of the past as, as our native nations have been the original stewards of this land and have been, uh, have adopted, not even adopted, have you know, created the most sustainable practices. And it's important for us to not look much further than the past to figure out ways that we can be uh, better to the earth. And I, I think that there is a lot of wisdom and a lot of guidance for us to, to, to gain still today. Great, uh, another set of questions here. Um, can you talk more about this idea of the Office of Environmental Justice and maybe describe a project or two that they would take on and, and try to tackle? So the environmental Office of Environmental Justice, I will say that uh, Wisconsin is one of the only Great Lakes states that does not have this office. Uh, this is actually one of the, the least innovative parts of the budget. Uh, Indiana and possibly Ohio are the only other states that don't have uh, and other Great Lakes states that do not have an Office of Environmental Justice. So this is uh, an area where we are playing catch up. This is to just get us on par with our Great Lakes neighbors, uh, given the fact that uh, water is such a vital resource, I don't have to explain that part. Uh, but the fact is, uh, with that sort of responsibility, uh, it comes all sorts of um, it, it, it comes all sorts of, of, of needs that, that that we have and a, a duty and that as a state to protect our waterways and protect people's drinking water. And um, we know that our lower income communities, our rural communities, uh, have the have the most to lose and oftentimes the least to gain. And in terms of water quality. Uh, these are communities that are oftentimes subject to poor water quality. And being subject to poor water quality is not a position that any person in any civilized society uh, should be subject to. Uh, the United States of America is apparently the most wealthy nation in the world, yet people still don't have access to clean drinking water. We're a nation of billionaires where people still don't have access to clean drinking water. That is an issue of environmental, just, in, environmental injustice. And the Office of Environmental Justice would seek uh, to uh, remedy that level of injustice, would seek to make sure that every community has access to basic resources, clean air, clean water. Uh, when decisions are being made about where roads are gonna be built, where highways are gonna be built, uh, where uh, how will we tire these coal burning power plants that need to come offline yesterday? Uh, that will be the work of the Office of Environmental Justice. We see um, communities that have been subject to air pollution caused by these coal burning power plants, uh, children growing up with respiratory illnesses, uh, and this disproportionately impacts lower income communities and communities of color as well. Great. Uh, another question here, sort of a pragmatic question. Do you think, uh, this is kind of a crystal ball question, do you think the legislature is gonna come around to support some of the climate related budget items? Um, and kind of a related question, what is being done maybe to work with the public and try to build support for executive and legislative action on climate? Yeah, so, um, you know, the task force had bipartisan legislative representation. Um, most of these recommendations were uh, universally um, universally accepted or signed off uh, on. And I'll say, I'm not gonna sit here and make up anything. It's not gonna be easy. It should be easy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some, sometimes common sense falls victim to partisan ideology. And this isn't a partisan issue at all. Um, we can look at, uh, 
levels of we can look at flooding for instance or we can even look at the state of texas and you saw the power outages because uh what should have been done to modernize the grid infrastructure had not been done and that power outage in texas didn't just target democrats uh and that's the way we have to look at this flooding it doesn't just rain uh over households that are registered Democrats or people who vote for Democrats. It's not the way the world works. It's not the way the environment operates. And so for legislators representing these areas who've been subject to historic flooding events, catastrophic weather events, uh, I mean, these are their constituents we're talking about. And it would be a complete shame for them to ignore the pleas of the people that they represent uh, based on their own political interests, because they don't want to work with Democrats, or they don't think that uh, climate change is real for whatever reason, although we have every uh, bit of evidence that we need to have uh, that shows the contrary. So with that being said, uh, I am still hopeful. And uh, with the last part of the question, how can the public be involved? Well, a lot of these solutions were generated through public input, uh, through the process of uh, task force meeting, um, we held public listening sessions where people were able to come in to give their opinion to talk about uh, what was important to them, to talk about the things that they were experiencing in real time and how we could be a part of the solution. And we are calling on people who were involved in that process to contact their legislators to make sure that these important items stay in the budget and also make sure that the items in the task force report that were recommended for legislative action get the support that they deserve. Yeah, that's great. I know one of the, uh, for this event, we have a number of exhibitors, believe it or not, here at the uh, Wisconsin Water Week event. You can access them through uh, the event platform. A couple of them that are kind of of interest. Again, you wouldn't expect them maybe to come to a water event. One of them is Northwind Renewable Energy based here out of central Wisconsin. And they've been basically hiring people, training people, and then going out and doing solar photovoltaic uh, installations all across Wisconsin. And they're a sponsor of this event. So they're trying to encourage people to learn about solar energy. It's not that it's not as mind blowing as it used to be, I guess. You can go out there and get, get the estimates. It usually makes budgetary sense for you to, to find a way to, to incorporate some solar into your home. And the other one is the Wisconsin Conservative Energy Forum, which again, what, you know, people might be thinking, what is the Conservative Energy Forum? And it's a, it's a small group of people, actually Governor Thompson, who's gonna be joining us tomorrow. Uh, former Governor Thompson is on their board um, and they uh, are asking people to engage on this issue, to at least talk. And people are finding common grounds with conservatives. Do you have a question coming in from the audience? Do you have any sort of tips for talking with conservative audiences and trying to um, explain the importance of climate and climate justice? Yeah, I would, um, I guess the farthest I've gotten in conversation is probably just the dollar and cents argument. You know, it is becoming increasingly uh, less expensive to operate and generate electricity with renewable energy than it is fossil fuels. And also, I think there are conversations to be had with, um, with sportsmen and women uh, when it comes to conservation because our forestry, our, 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 our land management is an important part of the puzzle. And if you want places to, to fish, you want places to hunt, um, it, is, it will be important that we, uh, that we implement as many conservation strategies as possible. And water quality is an issue. You're not gonna wanna fish for, uh, you know, you know, fish for fish in, in dirty contaminated water. And another issue too is how quickly our lakes are and our streams are warming up. Lake Superior is warming up quicker than the rest of the Great Lakes. Wisconsin, or excuse me, uh, Lake Michigan is warming up at a pretty rapid pace and that's threatening the uh, perch population. Some of our trout streams are warming up. And if our trout streams continue to get warmer, that will impact fisheries as well. And that becomes an issue of tourism too. We, we generate a, a, a bit of uh, international tourism to some of our trout streams. I know, of, um, uh, I know of people who come from China to right here in Wisconsin, the fish in our trout streams. Uh, as an example, and the people who are coming from China, they're coming from a whole lot of places that are closer. And if our um, 
tourism industry continues to be impacted by climate change, uh, that's going to affect our small business community. Uh, you look in Bayfield, I had a chance to go up there uh, my first year and um, you know, met with the mayor and he talked about water levels and how uh, tourism is being impacted. So if you want to make the argument about being uh, pro-business, especially small business, uh, I think it's important to make sure that our businesses aren't uh, living under the looming climate crisis uh, that will certainly threaten them if not put them out of business. Yeah, I like your point about trying to uh, address the, the financial issue and, and think about sort of what makes sense from sort of a, a um, taxpayer dollars as well as business dollars. And then when you look at the whole Wisconsin economy, it's just interesting how you know every coal train that comes into Wisconsin, every gas line that comes into Wisconsin, every oil line that comes into Wisconsin, there's another pipeline going the other direction paying for that product. It's sending money out of the state. It's sending your money out to pay for the coal, to pay for the natural gas. Whereas once you embrace and start using more solar, photovoltaic, and wind turbines, you start to reduce how much money is just leaving the state on a continuous basis. And that seems like a way to strengthen our economy. I was, I was having that conversation this morning. Um, I know it's only 8.45, but before this conversation, I was having a conversation about, about coal because I guess that's what I wake up and talk about in the morning. Uh, but yeah, it was just uh, about the cost to retire coal plants. I'm like, well, you know, think about the cost on ratepayers. Think about the cost to people uh, uh, across the state. There's the health costs, uh, but there's also the dollar and cents costs where, you know, as much coal as we use, about 40% to generate uh, our, our uh, electricity here in Wisconsin. How much of that is actually coming from Wisconsin? None of it. We are spending all this money uh, in other states, we are uh, we are financing uh, jobs and unsustainable industries that not only put our health and safety at risk, but also the people who are working those jobs. I mean, you know, coal jobs have come a long way since uh, since the 1800s, but at the same time, uh, it's still not the most safe uh, profession. It's also uh, not the most stable profession these days. Is uh, more coal plants come offline. We see coal mines also coming offline as well. Yeah, I think that, that paints that future, though, like for Northwind Renewable Energy, where they're in the hiring mode. They're looking to kind of ramp things up. So uh, I remain optimistic. We've kind of reached the end of our time for this initial morning session. I want to join the audience out there in thanking uh, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. Thank you. This is kind of awkward that you can't hear the people <laughs> out there, but I know there was a lot of people out there. And really the number one question was, thank you for being here, Lieutenant Governor Barnes. So I think that speaks a lot to how much people want to communicate, um, how much they appreciate your presence here and, and your presence in the state and the work that we're doing around climate. So thank you again for joining us.